Uh, I'm Vice President for Strategic Planning here at CSIS, and I'm co-directing our project on U.S. leadership and development, and looking at ways that new and emerging actors on the development scene, especially private companies and uh, NGOs and emerging economies, are shaping the world of development far beyond what we do in terms of bilateral and multilateral assistance. Um, this is part of our Chevron Forum on Development. Um, we're supported uh, by sh generously by Chevron, and we're really pleased to have you all here and hope that we will engage in a dialogue because there is a lot to talk about with uh, our current example. So I'm delighted to welcome Sue Clark. Uh, Sue is the Corporate Affairs Director for SAB Miller. She has a very large portfolio. Um, she manages investor relations, media relations, sustainable development, industry affairs, and corporate communications. She's fresh off of, you may have heard that um, Foster's is now part of SAB Miller's um, brand list. SAB Miller is a company that has a number of brands that you're going to be familiar with, but you may, maybe didn't realize they're all kind of bundled up under the, the same masthead. Peroni, uh, Pilsner, Cal, Blue Moon, Miller, of course, and now Foster's. So they've got a, a broad range of activities and operations and um, have engaged very deeply in the economies where they're working. I think a lot of you will be interested in one of the particular areas that we're going to talk about today, which is SAB Miller's uh, manufacturing facility or processing facility in, in Juba and South Sudan. But today we're going we're to kind of cover the uh, breadth of operations and activities that SAB Miller does, give Sue a chance to tell you a little bit about their various approaches, and uh, then focus in on a couple specific um, pieces. We're going to start talking about some of the enterprise development efforts, um, which are very, very deep down to smallholder farmers and local purchasing. We want to talk some about uh, South Sudan, of course, and then also talk about some um, health work, preventative and awareness work that the company is doing. So with that, um, Sue, thank you for joining us you. and taking the time with us today. Uh, I want to start by just asking you a little bit about SAB Miller, if you can tell us about the company. Because you're, you're a company founded in South Africa, based today in London. You've done really remarkable things in development and local sourcing. So I'd like to ask you if you could start by telling us about the company and tell us about your approach to developing communities. Okay, thank you. And it's, uh, it's, it's, it's great to be here. Um, as you said, SAB Miller is one of the largest global brewing companies. Um, our operations span 75 countries uh, across six continents and as you mentioned we are big here in the States. We bought the Miller business back in 2002 and that's now merged with the Coors business so we've got some 60% of that joint business Miller Coors. Um, but the majority of our businesses and our profits come from countries in the emerging or developing markets. So we are number uh, one in China, we have 25% of the, the Chinese beer market. We're number two in India, number two in uh, Latin America, and we have very strong positions in, in Eastern Europe. But of course, I think what we are famous for is our African background. As you, as you mentioned, we came out of South Africa. Uh, we now have operations either directly or with our partners in 35 African countries. And the African businesses together account for about a third of our overall business profits. I mean, we are a really good example of what a great base to do business Africa is. You know, over the last 10 years, our profits have grown on average 10%, uh, over 10% per annum each year. So, I mean, I, there's very few other places in the world, I think, where, where you could get that. I mean, just before I talk about our approach around development and, and building uh, economic growth, I just want to say one thing about alcohol. You know, we are an alcohol company, and we are concerned about the people who abuse our products. You know, we, we, we do know that it does cause harm when abused to the individuals and to you know, people around, around them. And we do see it as part of our responsibility, along with a whole bunch of other societal actors, to tackle some of that alcohol abuse. And I'm happy to talk about later about some of our programs that we mm -hmm. have to do that. But I think one of the things that it is worth pointing out is that in Africa, a lot of that alcohol abuse comes from illicit home-brewed alcohol. And you'll see, I think, as I go through and talk about what we're doing, is we're actually trying to move people away from that illicit home-brew and into regulated quality beers that are brewed according to standards and sold in, in regulated environments. So that said, how do, how do we think about the way we do business? Well, we believe deeply that a business like brewing is a local business. 
and that we only thrive if those local communities in which we work are healthy and are thriving as well. And so we, we look at our business along all of the components of the value chain and we say how can we ensure that we're maximising and localising each of those components from the very start of our raw materials all the way through to how our, our beers are sold. And so at the, at the the sort of beginning of that chain, the whole piece around where we access our raw materials, you know, traditionally these came from overseas, we imported into Africa, we're now increasingly moving towards sourcing locally that agri those agricultural raw materials, and we can, we can talk about that mm -hmm. maybe in a moment. And then moving up the value chain, it's how can we stimulate local distribution through financing uh, small businesses, small distributors to, to take our products um, out and about, and then how can we develop the retail sector, again, a lot of it through financing, through business development, through partnering. Um, there's a couple of other things I just wanted to say about our approach to business. I mean, I think we very much apply international, try and apply international standards as we move around the world. So, you know, when it comes to things like environment, we aspire to ensure that we have the same standards wherever we are, things like water, um, usage and things like effluent treatment and, the, and you know the way that we treat our employees and I think the third thing is we do try and foster go good governance as well and we think that businesses like ourselves have a particular role to play there both within our supply chain and also the, the broader business environment. Well tell us if you would um, about some of the work that you have done specifically on local sourcing and supply chains. You have made big investments in a number of countries uh, to develop new strains of of uh, crops to look for new places to grow crops so that you're not quite so vulnerable to help farmers to grow crops better and provide them to you and I'd like if you could sort of dig in and talk about a couple of those examples of how you've worked with farmers how you've um, managed to Im improve quality and quantity for your supply chains uh, and just give us a little more depth on that if you would yeah sure I mean I'd, I'd like to do that I mean essentially the the raw material for, for brewing for brewing beers is starch and so you know, traditionally, as I mentioned, we tended, we imported barley uh, from Europe, mainly Australia, some American barley, um, into Africa. And at its simplest, we're looking at how we can replace that barley by growing locally, and we've made some good progress there. But over the last few years, we really saw an opportunity to take indigenous starch um, crops like cassava and like sorghum and look at how we could use those to produce the sorts of clear beers that we were producing with, uh, with barley. And I think uh, probably the first example was, uh, was in Uganda, where we worked with the local agricultural institute to develop a strain of sorghum that we could use to brew a clear beer. Sorghum traditionally used to, build a, to, to produce a sort of an opaque beer called chibuku. Um, we also worked with government around you know, the opportunity to bring in a whole series of subsistence farmers into the commercial uh, space. And in recognition of that, the, uh, the Ugandan government gave us a small tax break, which meant that the overall mm -hmm. uh, cost of the, the beer could be lower. And we worked with a number, of, a number of NGOs. The result of all of that was that we actually produced a beer called Eagle Lager, which today actually accounts for 30% of our market share in Uganda. It has raised the amount of money that the government are getting from excise because, of course, it has moved people out of the illicit sector into the formal sector. Mm -hmm. It's enhanced public health. But most importantly, we now have 8,000 farmers in our supply chain who are actually receiving an income rather than being subsistent farmers. And we've got a whole series of kind of case studies and stories about how they're now using that money to send children to school, to buy bicycles, to diversify into other businesses. And I think it's probably just worth, worth, worth sort of mentioning that you know, when we do this, we do partner with uh, other NGOs mm -hmm. to provide extension services to farmers. We do find that we've had to, uh, that we offer uh, agreed prices and we, we, we undertake up front to, uh, to determine the quantities that we will take. Um, and we've also work with various financing institutions where there's a, there's a need for, for financing to, to be part of, to, to offer that. So it was pretty hard yards to start with, and one of the things we've learned is that actually it takes a while to build up trust. In those first years in Uganda, you know, we didn't actually get all of the sorghum we needed hmm. because you know, a lot of the farmers you know, weren't sure about this multinational company and what were they doing. And, and so you know, it took a couple of seasons for us to build up. We then had another big learning, 
we actually got too much sorghum. And so what do you do in that situation? You know, how do you kind of unwind that when you've made commitments to farmers? And so we've had to get a bit smarter around that. What were some of the approaches you took? Well, I think one of the key things is getting the right NGO to work with okay. and getting those, huh. those dialogues and those channels going. And I think, you know, partnerships are very much at the heart of mm -hmm. this. We're that, that Eagle example is now uh, throughout our portfolio in Africa and it's our second biggest regional seller in the African continent. Mm -hmm. We're very excited because we're just about to launch in the coming few weeks another new product called Impala, which I'm not sure whether I should have told you, but anyway, <laughs> that's its name. Um, and we're launching that in Mozambique and that's using cassava. Uh, which again is a, you know, an indigenous starch crop um, and we are hoping that we can have very similar kind of results in terms of bringing these small subsistence farmers into the, into the commercial sphere. And can I, can I ask, what, what's the taste difference among cassava beer and sorghum beer and barley beer? Uh, well, you have to be a connoisseur, but I mean, I think uh, <laughs> they, they, there, there are quite there are taste differences. They, t they occupy different positions in the portfolio. They're at different price points. Um, but I think, you know, the thing is that we're offering a quality product that is aspirational for people mm -hmm. and is something that, you know, consumers want to drink. Mm -hmm. That's so interesting. I wanted to ask a little bit more. Um, you all have been leaders in the, the Southern Growth Corridor in Tanzania. Mm -hmm. I wanted to ask a little bit about what you're doing specifically in Tanzania along that corridor and what you see shaping up there. Um, it's an area that Feed the Future and AID have put a lot of emphasis on. It's um, getting a lot of attention and be interesting to hear what you're seeing from your, your perspective. Yeah, I mean, we, we very much think that the, the growth corridor concept is a, is a great concept because it brings together, you know, the, the, the kind of infrastructure, the hard infrastructure that we very much need mm -hmm. in terms of sort of roads and irrigation, etc. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, we believe that the private sector has a role to play in the kind of last mile infrastructure, but the kind of the broader kind of um, the bigger pieces, then we definitely need, need governments to come to the party mm -hmm. there. And so we think that, you know, Tanzania is a good example of, of how that's happening. It's, you know, we sort of think of it a bit like a hub and spoke model that, you know, if you can get that infrastructure in place, then you can kind of come off of that with the sort of spokes in terms of developing bigger commercial agriculture and then around that smaller uh, developing mm -hmm. uh, smaller subsistence farmers as well. So we think, you know, taken together, that sort of model is hugely effective. I think it's still in its early days in yeah. Tanzania, and I think, you know, but one of the things I would say is I think the government has really backed it. Kitui has kind of, the president has really put his stamp behind it, and that has kind of made a big difference. So that's had a big impact. Mm. Um, just broadening out from Africa, when we talked earlier, you said that Colombia is your largest market for beer, which I was very surprised by. But I mentioned to you that um, it, it just reinforces what we've heard a lot over the past year in our conversations, that, that a lot of companies are approaching, um, approaching the countries beyond the US and Europe and Japan, because this is where they're seeing so much growth, especially with small consumables that people can afford to buy in a you know, fairly regular basis. I know you all see these countries really as the growth um, for the company, and you mentioned Africa as a, as a strong tail, but can you talk a little bit about how you're seeing the growth worldwide and, and why investing in these communities has been so important to you? Um, well, I mean, I think you, you very much hit the nail on the head there, is that the, the growth opportunity is in the emerging markets. I mean, in, in China, we, uh, as I mentioned earlier, we've got uh, just over a 20% market share there, which we've grown up since the early 1990s, uh, in partnership with a local partner. Um, and I think, you know, there we took very much an approach which was to start in the rural areas and then kind of work in mm. towards the cities. Um, it is our biggest market. Uh, I have to correct you. Colombia is one of our most profitable markets. Profitable. Okay, I misspoke. Okay. Uh, China, China is, uh, is, is whilst it accounts for a huge amount of our global volume, it uh, it doesn't account for a huge amount of our profits yet. Uh -huh. But uh, we are hopeful that that position will change uh -huh. in in time. But you know, huge growth there. I mean, India, as I mentioned earlier, we have a position there. Um, growth is is there. Uh, while the economy is growing quickly, India has a, a more difficult relationship with, with, with alcohol, so our beer mm -hmm. sales there are, mm -hmm. are sort of, you know, growing solidly. Uh, but Latin America, we, we entered there in 2005 through an acquisition, uh, the Bavaria acquisition. And again, we see those markets, you know, growing very, very quickly. 
Well, let's, um, let's just talk about a specific example. I think a lot of people here are interested in hearing about your work in uh, southern Sudan. If you could tell us about what you're doing, kind of how you ended up making the investments that you have made, what the process was that you went through in order to get land titling and intellectual property rights settled, as well as just what it took to get employers, or I'm sorry, employees and distribution networks in this, in sort of the newest country in the world. Well, I mean, we saw Sudan as, as actually a, a, a great opportunity. I mean, there's 8 million people in southern Sudan, an economy that's underpinned by oil, and actually we could see that there were demands for our products because they were being sucked in from Uganda to, as imports into to southern Sudan. So in 2008, 2009, we began to look at how we could enter the market. And, of course, there were challenges. Um, initially, one of the biggest issues was trying to find land and property and work out how property title worked, who owned the property. Um, and that took an enormous amount of legwork on the ground, working with uh, the putative government and the communities. And uh, we actually put together, I think, quite an innovative um, package, which means that the, the, the communities where we have built the brewery actually get royalties. Now, I think that situation has changed quite a bit since we first went in there and I think there is now a, a property land bank established. I guess the other big challenge was the whole piece around uh, the the way that um, legislation and regulation was very much in its early days mm -hmm. and uh, business registration, a Southern Sudan Central Bank wasn't set up so there were lots of kind of issues there that we had to work our way around. Now, not unfamiliar to us because some of the other African countries we've been into before had had very similar issues and we did have some expertise that we could help the government with in, in particular areas. I guess the other things were the usual challenges that come from going into post-conflict markets. You know, just the whole infrastructure piece. Mm -hmm. You know, you have to be 100% self-sufficient. So power, water, you know, you have to, you have to, uh, to put in for yourselves, effluent treatment, um, and obviously be cognizant to the fact that you know ra roads and basic infrastructure like that is, is, is very difficult. But we have resolved those issues. We invested initially 35 million in a brewery and soft drinks facility. That was up and running last year and is at now at capacity already and we're investing another 15 million to take the, the size of the, the brewery up. Uh, we employ 200 Sudanese people in the, in the brewery. And, you know, that's always quite difficult when you're in a post-conflict society, kind of working with people who've maybe not worked in a formal environment before, mm -hmm. so the whole training piece that go, goes with that can be quite intense. Um, and we've also started to develop the local sourcing piece. We uh, were the recipient of some uh, grant money from the Africa Enterprise Challenge Fund, which is a DFID fund. Uh, we've received uh, almost $900,000 there and we're working with an NGO called Farm Africa to develop a cassava supply chain with local farmers. But about 2,000 farmers now signed up. They are, we're hoping the first harvest will come through next year and that we'll be able to use that cassava in, in our, uh, in our to, to, produce, uh, to produce beer. Um, and we genuinely feel that that will actually stimulate broader economic development. I think the the multiplier effect we think should should actually underpin about 5,000 different, 15,000 um, people as part of that. And then the other piece that we're doing is we're actually using our facilities to purify water, to provide water to the local communities, currently mm. providing uh, water for about 7,500 people in and around the brewery and at the local university. And over the next year, we're looking to double that. Um, and hoping to kind of provide water to the UN compound there and various communities on mm. the way. So an exciting market, a market with, I think, lots of potential and one where we've had to be quite resilient and, mm -hmm. uh, and feel our way through. But, uh, yeah, it's looking, looking good. Tell me, what's the, what's the uh, radius of distribution from your brewery? Is it quite wide or is it still fairly limited? Um, I think it's... We're at capacity. Last month, our our mm -hmm. sales went up forty percent. Last it's month? Last yeah, last month. So we, you know, mm. in that circumstances, the you know, the, as the far way. as it can <laughs> go, and then and then you have to brew some more. Yeah. Um, and t can you talk a little bit more about some of the 
um, employment processes you've had to go through in terms of selecting employees, training, and some of the different um, skills building exercises you've gone through? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, generally, as I mentioned, you know, when you, when you are going into, into post-conflict societies, not just Southern Sudan, mm -hmm. but I mean, we went into Angola, Mm -hmm. um, we went into Mozambique there. I mean, you really do have to start at the very basic level, you know, and that's kind of, you know, sometimes teaching people hygiene processes and things and, you know, how to wash their hands and mm -hmm. use, you know, water faucets and all of that sort of thing, because, mm -hmm. I mean, generally, they, you know, it's not part of, of what they've been used to. Um, and so, you know, you have to start very much at the bottom level, you have to provide infrastructure in Angola is a very good example where we actually had to provide transport, you know, make sure that we help people to get to the mm -hmm. brewery and things mm -hmm. sort of as part of that, that whole process. Um, skills building is a challenge, you know, there is a lack of engineering skills across mm -hmm. the continent and we very much have to develop that our, ourselves very often. Mm -hmm. um, we do move people around between different countries and different breweries to develop the skills, similarly marketing is, a, is another area, mm -hmm. so right. quite intense, quite intense mm -hmm. and quite hands on. So you have a lot of local marketing effort, I suppose, to appeal to local markets, but you have to learn how to do all kinds of marketing. Yeah, I mean, we, we, have, we have ways that we do things, the marketing mm -hmm. way, which mm -hmm. kind of sets the mm -hmm. overall parameters. But of course, you know, brewing beer, the, the consumption of beer is very different in different uh, yeah. cultural settings. Right. So how you take those kind of generic kind of ways and actually localize them for the local uh, customs and practices me mm -hmm. is, is, means that you have to kind of empower people on the ground, yeah. Um. Okay, that, that's, I, I've all, and back to your other point about sanitation, I think it's a real challenge always for food and beverage companies. It's sourcing from farmers is one thing, but handling and cr creating processed, safe, sanitary food takes a great deal of skill, and um, you mentioned standards as mm. a key thing that you're uh, s doing as a part of your operations in different communities, and it strikes me that that's probably always going to be an ongoing challenge as you move into new environments. Yeah, and I think the other thing just to mention is that, you know, people sometimes forget, but, you know, 50% of food produced in Africa gets wasted because there's no infrastructure, mm -hmm. A, to mm -hmm. move it around, or B, to store it, or, or you know, the refrigeration. Mm -hmm. So that whole piece is just hugely important still. Okay, so you spend time mm -hmm. on that too. Um, well, I'm going to switch gears a little bit to talk about some of your work on health, mm -hmm. because you have, um, again, I think, as you mentioned, your your origins in Africa and your, your history there have led S.A.B. Miller to take on certain issues because they're so important in the local environment and health is one of those areas, especially on HIV AIDS and other areas. I wanted to ask if you could talk about some of your work on health and your programs that you have had in place in Africa and then mm -hmm. throughout the world. Well, I think HIV AIDS, I mean, if I could start there, I mean, as a, as a business with a long history in Africa, I mean, we very much start thought at the, at the outset that this was a kind of moral and business issue that was clearly going to impact on our employees, on our customers, our consumers, and, and the kind of communities in, in which we work. And the board took a decision that we would actually step into this space, particularly with our own employees. And it's quite interesting to look back because you know, there wasn't a big business case done. It was a kind of, you know, hmm. we've, got to, we've got to step in here and we, we've, we've got to do something. And with our own employees, obviously, the start was to offer voluntary counselling and testing. You know, again, it's kind of not easy to get people to, yeah. to do that. And, you know, what we had to do was build it into managers' goals so that, you know, they had to get their employees, so many of their employees, to test during the course of the year. So you built it into... Uh, manager standards and evaluations. Yeah, so that oh. their performance was, de you know, at the end of the year, they would be measured huh. on how many of their staff mm -hmm. they'd got through mm -hmm. voluntary counselling and mm -hmm. testing. Uh, what gets measured gets done mm. is one of our, mm -hmm. our, our views. Um, and, you know, I'm pleased to say now in the last year we've got about 75% of our employees actually have gone through the annual wow. testing and, and, and so that process keeps going. Um, we provide antiretrovirals to all of our HIV AIDS positive employees and up to six family dependents and that's, that's for th through, through their lives. Um, and we, you know, clearly the whole piece about education and awareness is hugely important. We have a big peer educator network. And in countries where the prevalence is high, we have about one peer educator to every 13 employees. So quite a big wow. resource that we've, uh, we've put in there. Um, and the big challenge, the next big challenge, is how you reach out to people's spouses. 
because one of the things that I, you know, always find it difficult to understand is that you know, some of our HIV AIDS positive employees don't bring their families and their spouses onto the program, don't get them tested. So we're looking at innovative ways now of how you can get families to test and how you go into homes. And you know, one of our countries, Uganda, is quite advanced there. I think they've got 20% of their spouses now tested as part of that program. Where is that? 20% of spouses are now tested as part of the HIV AIDS program. Mm -hmm. So moving from the sort of employee piece into the supply chain, and this is kind mm -hmm. of where it all sort of li mm -hmm. links back, because you know, we then started to say to ourselves, well, how do we extend this into our supply chain, those farmers that we, small scale farmers, into truckers, into retailers, how do, we, how do we make sure that they have access to, to similar testing mm -hmm. programs? And, and we've been rolling that out progressively, and we've got partnerships with uh, USAID in Uganda around truckers' programs to get mm -hmm. truckers' testing and things. Um, and I think one of the, the exciting things that we're now doing is, is kind of saying, well, how can we really use our, our distribution systems and some of our skills to kind of take it to the next level? So in South Africa, we've got a new program with the Global Fund where we're using our trucks and our distribution system to distribute condoms to retail outlets. We've got about 6,000 retail outlets on the program there. We do it in conjunction with the South African Health Ministry so that they're kind of doing the follow-up and making sure that those condoms are being used appropriately. Is this the Men in Taverns program, or is that different? Well, it's part of it. That's mm -hmm. part of the same program. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, we distribute the condoms, and we're also working with local NGOs to do education in taverns. So programs over a series of six weeks with, with men in taverns, uh, help working with them around HIV AIDS, gender violence, uh, kind of work skills, etc. So a, a program to really sort of try and tackle alcohol abuse at mm -hmm. its very kind mm -hmm. of origin. And so that's all kind of part of the, the same mm -hmm. program. I, mean, I, I, I mention it because I think these are very difficult issues to tackle, especially for an alcohol company. So it's a very unique and interesting way that you've approached it. And I think, again, it comes so much out of your origins um, in yeah. South Africa and throughout the continent. Yeah, and I mean, I d just, just one little rider. I mean, I said we didn't do a business case at the start, but actually we did do some work last year to say, well, actually, you know, what's been the cost of this? Mm -hmm. And it's very interesting how, you know, there is a... You can, you can show the benefits from investing in these sorts of areas. That's interesting. What did you find? Well, we actually found that if we netted off all of the costs of our employee programs mm -hmm. and, and benefits mm -hmm. in South Africa, we actually had a net surplus at the end of it. Which, And we also found that you know by just tweaking it a little bit and really just stepping up those levels of testing a bit more that there were even more benefits mm. to be saved. So you know there is a business case there, which I think is very interesting as well. And I should note, we found lots of materials on your website, including a number of white papers and issue papers that um, the audience might be interested in looking at as well. Um, I, I see a number of people in the group who are going to want to ask you some questions, but let me ask you one more question before we um, go to the audience. I wanted to ask, given um, all of your experiences and sort of your trials and errors, what would be the couple, two or three pieces of advice you would give to other companies who are trying to operate in some of the same environments or situations where you have been practicing and learning different uh, approaches? Look, I mean, I think one of the things is that you've got to do the right thing in these markets mm -hmm. and that the business success follows. Mm -hmm. And that I think that is our approach. And I think some of that goes back to the original business DNA. We were mm -hmm. talking earlier about you know, SAB operated under uh, difficult times in South Africa for many years and actually stepped into the vacuum that was created by government and actually you know part of the company's DNA is that it sees itself as, as, as kind of business has a role to play in developing communities and, and developing economies um, I think the other point is partnerships mm -hmm. I mean we've talked to, talked a lot about that as we've, we've gone through the conversation mm -hmm. but you know, I think we genuinely believe that it's very difficult for a company to do these things on their own. You do need partnerships with governments, you need partnerships with NGOs, partnerships with, with civil society. I think innovation would be one of the things I say. You know, you, you know our, our model is all about being local, thinking local, doing, you know, innovating locally. And I think you've got to be prepared to, to, to do that. Um, and I think, you know, the, the one thing I would <coughs> sign off with is really, you know, how do you leverage your value chain? I think you know so very often you read about 
companies going into these sorts of markets and, and doing straightforward philanthropy and corporate social investment. Absolutely, there's a place for that, and we do that as well. But I think where you can really, really make the difference is by leveraging your core business, leveraging that value chain. Um, and through that, you can actually, you know, you, through the multiplier effect, really make a difference. Well, thank you. These are interesting points because I would say that, um, you know, the big themes that we've heard, as I mentioned, is emerging markets are the, are the destination for a lot of uh, forward profits. We hear a lot <coughs> that leveraging business assets and attributes and the way you naturally operate in these environments is a key way to promote development in communities. And then um, certainly uh, the whole local content, local sourcing and capacity building piece that comes along with that is always an, an important theme that comes up when we talk with different companies about what they're doing. So with that, I see a lot of people who probably have questions, so I want to open up to the audience. Bruce, you're here, over here. Do you want to start? If you'll just um, stand up, say your name. And your question, I'm going to repeat it because we don't have microphones for you today. Okay. My name is Trey Thomas. I'm a PhD student at George Mason University in conflict resolution. My question is about uh, the issue of basic infrastructure and South Sudan and its development. Um, because that, you were talking earlier about how there are needs there, and I'm sure that makes an impact on your export process. I'm wondering, is there a role in your company to help in the actual development of, of basic infrastructure in terms of roads and highways, uh, you know, coordination with the government? Uh, and what your export process is like right now and how it's affected by the basic infrastructure needs and if you have any lobbying efforts with the government to kind of address those issues. So the question was around uh, infrastructure in South <coughs> Sudan and uh, how much SAB Miller is getting engaged in that process or if you're leaving it to the government and uh, any kinds of sort of export models that you're looking at. Okay. And that's in relation just to Southern Sudan? Yeah. Right. But yeah. But that's yeah. yeah. Well, let's, let's start from the back. I mean, export models, I mean, generally what we do is we, we don't export beer between markets. Mm -hmm. A, because it's quite heavy, mm -hmm. so to truck it mm -hmm. long distances doesn't work, and B, because you have to cross borders and that whole kind of excise piece across mm -hmm. borders is quite tricky. So around the world, actually, there is, there is very little export. Um, so, so, so that's probably not something that we would, we would look to do. Uh, when it comes to working with government, yes, we do work with the government. In fact, we were uh, partner. We were, were talking to them quite in, uh, extensively about how we can use our experience to attract other investment into Southern Sudan. And I think we've got. We feel we've got a role to play there. And I know we've hosted various things in the UK. Mm. We were hoping to be part of the, the, the mission that was coming over this weekend, but I'm not quite sure that that, that happened. So I think there is a role for us to, to play there. When it comes to infrastructure, I think you're right. I think we need to be part of that, that dialogue. We do kind of invest in the last mile infrastructure. Um, and you know we do partner with governments around developing infrastructure. Um, I would have to get back to you on the kind of you know, detail in, in Southern Sudan at that level. Next question. Bruce? Hi, I'm Bruce. Hello. Um, just a question about uh, how these kinds of transactions work vis-a-vis -vis you at the corporate governance center and your colleagues in local companies, affiliates in the field. Do they look to you as a kind of a resource for best practices gleaned? Do they look for you as a source of investment into their supply chains? Is it sometimes a hard sale for an overall corporate approach that says we will invest in our supply chain by investing in local production. Um, and yet you may have local business managers with different time horizons mm -hmm. or different incentives. So the question was about how um, at the corporate level you work with uh, smaller companies and affiliates on the local content piece. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's tricky, and I mean, I, I wouldn't um, say that we have all the answers. I mean, we see that the, the PLC level is about setting the policies, and I think there we spoke about how if you look at our website, there's a whole kind of bunch of, of position papers mm -hmm. there. We, sit, we, um, we also set the, the sort of standards piece, and there we have 10 sustainable development priorities that cover um, a whole host of things from environment, things like HIV, AIDS, supply chain, etc. And we monitor our performance against those 10 sustainable development priorities. And twice a year, we will sit down with the managing director from the market and the CEO of the global company, and we'll go through mm -hmm. how they're performing against those 10 sustainable development priorities. And we have a whole measurement system and monitoring system to, to inform those debates. 
When it comes to local sourcing, um, the individual businesses have picked that up to as part of their overall business goals. So Africa as a region has it as one of its kind of key priorities. I think it's got three priorities and one of those priorities is go farming. And you know they have picked this up and are running with it, not because I tell them to at the centre, but because they see real business benefits in terms of quality, in terms of reduced import costs, in terms of actually stimulating local economic benefit. And what we can do there is we can then share best practices between markets. We have over the last two or three years have gone in and kind of you know done deep dives into which models work best and then kind of shared some of that, that kind of learning between. Um, occasionally there are things that happen that kind of divert them for you know for instance I can think over the last couple of years where they've been issues that have arisen either because of climate issues or because of government dis dislocations that have kind of caused us maybe to kind of pull back on some of these things but I mean you know I think the way we think about it is we try and set the framework for the top we monitor it and that you know we hope that the businesses see the benefit of this and run with it because genuinely there are benefits and that's what we're finding. Uh, Tony Carroll. Hi, Tony Carroll of Manchester Trade. Um, as far as quality goes, uh, having in, taken advantage of the product in West Africa, I can say it's very good. In fact, there's quite a cult following in the UK for um, Nigerian Guinness. <laughs> so uh, there is you know, yeah. something of a, yeah. of a reverse sort of uh, mm. uh, uh, branding. Um, I'm wondering about if you could comment about any of the impact of President Ian Kama's recent moves about raising a substantial tax levy on alcohol. I think his uh, objectives were uh, that uh, alcohol creates uh, perhaps a, a related to HIV incidents in the country. I think it's been shown that alcohol does have a relationship. And secondly, um, driving fatalities and other uh, problems. I'm wondering if we've seen any data yet to suggest that there has been any uh, elasticity in demand, any reduction in consumption, and are you fearful that other countries will adopt uh, Ian Thomas' uh, principles? Okay, question about uh, taxes on alcohol and uh, sort of managing some of the different concerns and issues around its use. Yeah, I mean, I think um, Ian Karma has taken quite a um, crusading stand against alcohol. And when he took over as president, he one of his first uh, proclamations was to say that he was going to put a 70% levy on alcohol. Um, that actually fell back to 30% and, and has risen to 40%. And yes, it did have a very, very big impact on sales. In fact, when I was talking about dislocations, that's one of the dislocations that kind of, you know, you, you then pull back from some of your local sourcing because you haven't got the, the outlets for the products. Um, in Botswana, we do um, produce soft drinks, so there has been some displacements into the into the soft drink side. Um, however, I think the big question is: is this tackling alcohol abuse? And the evidence that we see, and we we there has been an independent study done, and the um, those findings haven't come out, is that you know what it's done by making beer more expensive, commercially produced beer more expensive, has pushed people into the illicit alcohol sector. So when you go to Botswana now, you know, you do see a lot of home brew, the kind of, you know, pots with people with long straws, you know, and I would question whether we've actually seen a reduction in alcohol abuse or whether we've actually seen a drop in the consumption of commercially produced alcohol, we've certainly seen a drop in the amount of excise taxes that have gone through to the government. So mm. I think it's a, it's a watch this space. Mm. In the back. Hi, um, I'm Sasha. I'm a law student in BC, so naturally I have to ask um, of what challenges you might have faced um, in developing rule of law in a post-conflict area, particularly when it comes to investment and corruption and standards mm. um, that exists at the international level, but maybe Okay, question about uh, rule of law in post-conflict environments and so how do you manage some of those issues? Look, I mean, corruption is not an issue just in post-conflict societies. It's an issue in a lot of places in which we work. And, you know, this probably sounds a bit Pollyanna-ish, but you kind of have to set yourself very high standards and then enforce those standards. And actually, it can be very painful. 
and I can give you examples and it's always kind of quite hard to sort of share them in these sorts of fora where the company has foregone quite significant profits for periods of time where we have had to pull back from business transactions because <coughs> of uh, problems with, with corruption. Um, we do see it as kind of part of our role to try and kind of change some of that and you know did a big initiative when we first went into Colombia around working with the local chamber of commerce to kind of raise the whole kind of business ethics issue with businesses mm. in Colombia and we started a three-year program and pledges and training with the, with the, uh, the local chamber of commerce there and I think you know that mm. has had some some positive benefits so we do we do see it as kind of something that we have to keep uh, keep really vigilant about uh, right in the back So question about limits to growth in uh, South Sudan and other types of businesses that might uh, have a good opportunities. Yeah, I mean, uh, look, I mean, there, there will be clearly a limit to, to, to our growth there. I mean, we do have soft drink opportunities there as well. We've got a small water business and, uh, and, and other sort of uh, soda type products. So I think that there's obviously opportunities there. You know, we are a beverage player and we wouldn't kind of diversify into, into other markets. But I think what it shows is that consumers do have disposable income and that f you know, for products, um, small value products like, yeah. uh, like ours, there are other opportunities for fast moving consumer goods. So you know, sort of in the, um, in the other sort of food, food industry areas, I think there, there's good opportunities. In the front? Yes, uh, I'm Femi Akibi, uh, ADC. Uh, do you have any other programs apart from the water program you mentioned earlier? Uh, that is to help the community, or do you have anything in partnership where a bottling company that is doing say beverages could use your facility, or do you have any kind of arrangement? And I wanted to know, in case you run to a situation where the government is trying to stop the <coughs> issue of alcohol, uh, mostly the most, if a Muslim person take over in any government, there's a tendency for that. Do you have a backup plan where you can use that same facility to supplement mm -hmm. into the food process in the arena? And I want to know if you are in Nigeria and Trinidad and Tobago. Okay, let me summarize those questions. So it was, do you have partnerships where uh, you have other ways of using your facility? Do you have a backup plan in case you have to um, scale back on brewing and use your facilities to uh, produce other products? And then the third question was just about other places where you're operating, Nigeria and Guinea? Trinidad and Tobago. Okay, we're not in Trinidad and Tobago, but we are in Nigeria. We have uh, uh, three facilities there, one in Port Harcourt, one which was the uh, brewery at Pabot. We have a uh, water business, the Voltic water business, and we've just uh, announced that we're building a brewery at Anisha. Um, so, small foothold there, but I mean, obviously a, a market with, with great opportunity. Do we have a backup plan? Um, not, not, not as such, but uh, we, uh, we do produce um, non-alcoholic malt beverages in, uh, in a lot of our markets mm -hmm. and uh, in Africa, which uh, we market as a, well, as a, as a, as a, a non-alcoholic beverage that's, that's obviously good for you. And uh, that, that actually is particularly successful in some of our Latin American countries as well. So... Uh, but I hope it would never come to that because, you know, as we saw in Prohibition in America, you know, making alcohol consumption, commercial alcohol production illegal does not tackle the issues of alcohol abuse. In fact, you know, as we saw there, as we've seen in other societies as well when Prohibition has been brought in, actually alcohol abuse, you know, goes up plus all of the other lawlessness that goes with that. So, you know, genuinely I do hope that that doesn't... Uh, come to pass because I don't think it will actually resolve the issues that, that people want to tackle. Do we share our facilities with other people? Um, I can't think of examples where we might actually share our actual production facilities. I can think of examples where we open up our 
buying uh, processes. So, for instance, in South Africa, there's lots of small brewers, mm -hmm. and we actually buy on their behalf barley and hops mm -hmm. and actually sell it on at cost to them so that they benefit from our kind of scale and our, and our buying chain. How did that program get started? Um, I think that, that you know what you find amongst the brewing fraternity is that there's quite a lot of goodwill and that you know it's brewing is sense. something that goes back a long way yeah. and you know these people you know that there's a lot of kind of uh, links between mm -hmm. brewers in the uh, in the markets. Great. Okay. Uh, right here in front. Hi, Joel Pick of the U.S. Global Leadership Coalition. You mentioned one partnership with USA. I, I believe it's with truckers, but I was wondering more broadly. Um, when you're looking at your own uh, activities around whether it be HIV AIDS or farmer training, how do you partner with official development clubs and cement? Do you seek out or is it just sort of more happenstance where they do show up? And how could the uh, government program be better tailored to find where development objectives and investment objectives from private companies meet? It's as if we planted you mm. to say that, to, to give us that question. Um, one of the focus areas of our work um, in our development project is looking at partnerships and precisely to your question, how are companies partnering with um, official development uh, agencies? Do you seek out partnerships? What are the what are things that are making it easier to partner or frustrating? We're actually going to be releasing a paper on November 1st. Neville Isdell, the former uh, CEO of Coca-Cola, will be here to release that paper exploring this very question. So um, we'd love to have some more input from you on that question. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think we tend to start with the area, with, with our own business. So we see an opportunity. And then the question is then, how do you access that opportunity? How do you, how do you leverage that opportunity? And you know, we would then probably that we, we then start to look at who we might work with and how you know if we need external funding do you know it's quite interesting because sometimes it's quite a hard sell for our local people mm -hmm. they would actually much rather get on and do it and bring in you know local ngos who they know and they trust and they've kind of got a relationship with and sometimes you know it's quite a hard sell on our behalf to say well you know but we can leverage funding for here or, or there, and they kind of go, do you know what? You know, <laughs> that brings me a whole bunch of grief. <coughs> and so it is a balancing act uh, in that process, and sometimes these things can be quite time consuming. You know, our business does tend to be a bit action orientated, so people, you know, once they've decided they're gonna do it, they wanna get on and do, so, you know, having a two or three year kind of time lag is, 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 is difficult. However, Sa having said that, I think the opportunity now that we've got <coughs> some of these programs up and running and kind of, you know, we know the quirks and we, we know, you know the, the, the pitfalls and things, there's more opportunities now to partner to get that scale. I think it's an easier sell to kind of, to the business to kind of say, well, you know, we know how this works so we can, we can, we can bring in partners and particularly on the HIV AIDS uh, piece where we were talking about the uh, the tavern intervention programs, we're we're hoping to to do that uh, over the where well, we started that process. Um, how do you make it easier? I, 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 it, transparency, you know, speed, all things that kind of help help uh, people like myself sell it to to the business and, and put the hours into into do it. You know, mm. it's very interesting. Other questions? Um, I actually have a question around water. Uh, as I mentioned, so Neville Isdell is on our board, and the current chairman of Coca-Cola, Mutar Kent, is on our board. And they have done a lot of work on water. And I know you do some bottling with Coca-Cola. And you look at water. You use water a lot. I wanted to ask about your programs around water use and uh, how you're thinking about it, how you see it, how you see the company handling it going forward, and what are some of the areas that you think that um, you know, governments and companies need to be thinking about water. Water policy is such a tricky challenge because it tends to be relatively inexpensive, if not completely free. Uh, so it's, I think, always going to be a challenge to manage from a policy perspective. So I'm interested in how you guys are looking at it and sort of what things you're thinking about. Yeah, I mean, uh, water is, is, is probably our number one priority mm -hmm. when it mm -hmm. comes to the, the kind of whole environment mm -hmm. piece. I mean, we are big users of water in our breweries. That won't surprise you. But the interesting thing is that if you think about the way we use water, we probably use on average sort of four and a half litres per litre of beer that we produce in a brewery. 
but actually to produce the barley that goes mm -hmm. into that beer can take 100, 120 litres. Okay. And so you know, looking again at the whole kind of chain and how we kind of work with the, with the chain to, to reduce water uh, consumption. And so a couple of years ago, we partners with uh, WWF mm -hmm. um, in half a dozen places around the world. And we've actually been working on doing some water footprinting with them to really understand where the water use is in our production process, mm -hmm. in the, in the mm -hmm. supply chain process. We've partnered, as I said, with WWF and GIZ, the, uh, the German funding agency as part of that. And after those, uh, we've carried out the, the initial footprint in each of those countries, and now we're building sort of multi-stakeholder partnerships to tackle some of the issues that we found as a consequence mm -hmm. of that water footprinting. So for instance, in Ukraine, you know, we found that um, the areas where we were growing our barley were very much stressed and that you know there were issues there that we needed to work with local farmers around how irrigation could be more effective and uh, uh, similar issues in, in, in Tanzania and, and Peru. Um, so we see ourselves, you know, we have issues or challenges to make sure that we're as efficient as possible in our breweries and our target is to reduce our water consumption by 25% compared with 2008 by, by 2015. 25%? Okay. Yeah, by 2015. So start at the breweries, go up the, 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 suppl the, uh, the supply chain through the work with WWF and then we're active uh, along with people like Coke and Nestle at the sort of regional and global level mm -hmm. in terms of trying to kind of influence policy there. And uh, we've been part of a, a big piece of work with M McKinsey and the Water Resources Group to look at uh, how policy can develop in those areas. Great. There are other questions from the audience? OK. Uh, we have two here. I'm going to bundle you two together, if you don't mind. Why don't you go first? Hi, I'm Jeannie Ellis from Cardinal Emerging Markets. I had a question about the monitoring and measuring. Sustainable development can be a different, difficult uh, thing to monitor and measure. So I would just like to hear a little bit more about how you do that, and do you sort of look at both the softer impact side of improving social license to operate, but then also how that directly impacts your bottom line, because that obviously makes it easier to, to do future programs if you can show that link between you know, the employee and community programs with the impact on the bottom line. Thank you. Okay, so first question about monitoring and measurement, and your question? Hi, uh, Dick Morford, most recently with UNDP, but um, I was wondering, in Sudan you said that you were had some problems with the uh, regulatory environment, with the infrastructure, and I was just wondering more broadly, when you look at countries around Africa and even elsewhere in the developing world, what kind of issues do you really find generally when you go into these, particularly in new markets, uh, and you have problems with uh, corruption, uh, property protection, um, and how do you work both as a corporation and locally to try to change the environment so that it's better? Do you work with other companies? Do you find yourselves working with uh, other government representatives and representatives of various governments that you have home kind of based in? Or how, how do you go about that? So the second question then is about uh, operating environment. What do you face when you enter a new um, a new market and how do you manage some of those challenges? Okay, well let, let's start with the, the SD piece. I mean absolutely it's difficult to measure and monitor. Um, when I first joined the business sort of uh, nine years or so, the company had been an early adopter of the GRI standards. And as I went around the business and talked to all of our MDs in markets, I'd say, well how do you use this data? And they'd go, bugger if we use it, I hope you use it because you know we're collecting this all and you know I hope somebody's using it. I, I kind of go, well. Um, and actually what we found was that um, they weren't using it and the reason why they weren't using it was they felt it was complicated and you know all the rest of it. So what we did was we started a process which took a couple of years of <coughs> consulting with the business on what were the key issues that they thought we should be measuring. So you know we worked directly with the countries but we also worked with our functional groups so the technical folks, the human resources folks, the supply chain folks. And out of that, we developed these 10 sustainable development priorities that I mentioned earlier, of which four around environment, one around enterprise development, HIV AIDS, supply chain standards, transparency, human rights, and, and corporate social investment. And then within each of these, we developed uh, KPIs. And actually, we arranged them into what we call a staircase. So for each of the 10 priorities, you have a 
was four and it's now been extended to five level staircase and within each level of the staircase are a series of quantitative and qualitative ind indexes and to move up the staircase you have to kind of tick off all the indices. Now the interesting thing is that when we finished all of that process we managed to fold all of the GRI uh, performance indicators into the 10 and into the stairway process but do you know what it now means that our businesses can measure themselves on this stairway and they can look at themselves in Poland and they can go do you know what checks now at level four on this stairway and we're only at level three so you know what can we do to get ourselves up to level four and the whole process of the consultation process and then this kind of having these internal benchmarks that are very visible which people can compare each other against and kind of giving them a lexicon that is our lexicon mm. and our language which they can identify with has radically changed the whole debate mm. And then by actually having these six monthly check-ins with the global chief executive and the regional managing director to look at performance against these stairways has actually transformed the whole process. So um, I guess that's our experience there. Um, gosh, I think we need all afternoon to uh, answer the question on the second question. I mean, and also it's the sort of thing that would be quite useful to have a kind of one-on-one -on -one dialogue because, you know, some of the things are, are quite challenging that, that we have found. Um, and every market is different, you know, it's very hard to, to generalise. And also it's not just new markets that, you know, where, as I mentioned earlier, where you kind of tackle things like corruption, where you have issues around the legal system and the kind of vested interests and that sort of thing. They, they, they are everywhere and, uh, you know, we have to, you know, we have our value set and our standards and we have to, and we have to apply them and, you know, very happy to give you some more detail in a in a one on one if that'd be helpful. All right, well we're coming upon four o'clock and I wanna ask you one last question because I'm looking at a pictures of all your different brands and I want to just ask what's your favorite SAB Miller product? <laughs> <laughs> well it has to be Peroni I think. Aha, yeah. uh -huh. <laughs> a, per a Peroni woman you heard it yeah. here. All right well please join me in thanking Sue. We just so enjoyed our conversation today. <laughs>